Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome to this next series on prostodontics, one of the main clinical topics that appears on part two of the dental board exams. And it actually has some of the most questions of the entire exam, with 51 out of the total 500. So we'll start with general considerations, then move on to removable prostodontics, and finally finish up talking about fixed prosthodontics. And here is the exact question breakdown from the National Board Dental Exams Part 2 with general considerations, removable pros and fixed pros being the three categories that we're going to focus on together. So that being said, like all of my videos, I'm going to focus only on the highest yield things you need to know for the exam. And while I'm gearing these videos for exam preparation, they are also designed to give you a nice overview for clinical application and general knowledge. All right, so prosthodontics is the branch of dentistry concerned with the design, manufacture, and fitting of artificial replacements for teeth and other parts of the mouth. We'll be talking a lot about replacing missing teeth or repairing damaged teeth with artificial teeth. So in a very simplified way, you can think of pros being all about fake teeth. There are many diagnosis and treatment planning considerations to take into account when replacing missing teeth, and this is what we're going to be focusing on primarily in this first video of the series. So I love this picture because it simply shows a lot of the treatment options we have in prosthodontics. Here is a crown that is being used to repair a single tooth. This image is a see-through transparent image showing a post which is placed into the prepared root canal of a root canal treated tooth to help retain the core filling, which you can see here, and the core is used to support an overlying crown. Here we have a dental bridge which is used to replace a single missing tooth and potentially repairing teeth adjacent to that space with their own special crowns that help hold the bridge together. Here we have a partial denture which is used to replace multiple missing teeth or in some cases a single missing tooth. Here we have an implant which is a popular but expensive way of replacing a single tooth or multiple teeth, or even an entire dental arch. And here we have another picture of the implant components. Here is the implant retained crown and something called an implant abutment, which seats into the implant itself. And we'll talk more about all of these things in more detail. But first, let's talk about the anatomy of the bridge. So the bridge has certain terminology associated with it that I want to make sure we can cover in this first video. So the first one is the abutment, and this is different from the implant abutment I just talked about. An abutment simply is referring to the tooth to which the bridge attaches. So in this image here, there are two abutments. The first one is this one, the abutment tooth here, and this one, the abutment tooth here, because these are the two teeth that the bridge is seating onto. Next we have the retainer, which is the crown that attaches to the abutment. So I'll underline this in that color, and let's grab a new color here. So the retainer is actually part of the bridge. So it's the crown that attaches to the abutments we just circled. So that's going to be this one here and this one here. Those are the two retainers. So they're being retained by the abutment tooth, or you can think of it any certain way you'd like. There are crowns that are part of the bridge. And now let's go to the pontic, which is the essentially fake tooth in the center of the bridge. So in this image here, the pontic is referring to this tooth right here. Now, of course, this is a what we'd call a three-unit bridge, has one, 
to three crown components, but bridges can be four units or five units long, etc. And so there could be, say, two pontics in the center or even three pontics. Um, it depends on how long the bridge is. And lastly, we have the connector, which I love this term because it's very self-explanatory. It connects the retainer to the pontic. So the two connectors would be right here and right here. And depending on the material used for the bridge, they can be connected, fixed together. Um, if it's all one ceramic piece or the, a metal framework that has been um, welded together, um, there are different options. Those are what we refer to as connectors. So you can see them in this image right there. All right, and that's the basic anatomy for a dental bridge. And some of these terms will appear as we go through different considerations for prosthodontics. Now, certain situations are not ideal for bridges, and we don't recommend bridges in every certain situation where a patient's missing tooth, uh, missing a tooth or missing teeth. So the first one is having half or less bone support. This is referring to the support of bone around an abutment tooth, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about crown root ratio, which is coming up very shortly. There's also a this thing called a single retainer cantilever, and a cantilever is what I'm showing in this image here. It's basically, you can think of it like a pontic that instead of being supported on both sides by a retainer, is kind of left out in the open and is not bound to a retainer on this side. So just kind of hanging out. And you can imagine how this isn't the greatest design, particularly for a posterior region. If you have a distal cantilever like this, that's very, well, it's not very ideal because you're gonna have heavy occlusal forces from the opposing molar if there is one. And this could be the connector right here is an area of weakness and can certainly fracture on you. Cantilevers are mostly used for uh, anterior teeth, like a mesial cantilever to replace a missing lateral incisor is probably the, one of the more common uses of it. So it's used in very specific situations and using a single retainer cantilever, particularly in the posterior, is going to carry a very poor prognosis and wouldn't imagine it lasting very long. Having multiple abutment teeth splinted together is another situation that carries a poor prognosis. Using non-rigid connectors is also um, very, very specific in use. It should be applied very, in very specific situations. So in this image here, I'm showing a non-rigid connector. Instead of being bound together with the whole bridge being one piece, this has this lock and key mechanism where the bridge can sort of click into place if one of the abutment teeth is kind of tilted off axis. That's when it's really used. And there are these components called the tenon, which is the male component, and the mortise, which is the female component. And they kind of slide together like a, a key and a keyway. And you can see the keyway in this image here. And then we have intermediate abutments which are also called peer abutments. And so that is, a peer abutment is when you have an abutment tooth that's being used to support a bridge all by itself. It doesn't have any teeth adjacent to it. And this, in fact, is probably the, the place where you'll see that non-rigid connector used the most. And so an intermediate abutment would be uh, this natural tooth or an implanted tooth substitute without other natural teeth in proximal contact with it. Again, that's our definition of the peer abutment. And so it's used along with mesial and distal abutments here to support a prosthesis. And, you know, this non-rigid or um, non-rigid connector or even using a cantilever here are strategies to try to reduce stress on this peer abutment because when it's all by itself it can be torqued in one way or the other and just not a great situation to have a fixed prosthesis spanning this long area so 
These are all situations that can have a poor prognosis if a bridge is used, and one of these other options we talked about may be more beneficial to think about. So there are also certain teeth that should never be used as an abutment tooth. So it's well known that endo-treated teeth become weaker, and so compromised endodontically treated teeth should not be used as abutments because the removed dentin makes them weaker. And I want to be super, super clear on this because there's a misconception out there that it's because the pulp tissue has been removed and the tooth somehow becomes drier or weaker without the nutrient support from the pulp. That's not what's going on. An endo-treated tooth is weaker because there's internal tooth structure, there's this dentin that has been removed as part of the endodontic treatment, which we covered in depth when we did the endodontics uh, series for the National uh, Board Exam Part 2, and removing that internal dentin makes the tooth weaker. It has less, less uh, tooth material, and so that's what makes it weaker. Not great to be used, and especially if it's a compromised endodontically treated tooth, would not definitely would not recommend using that as an abutment to support a crown or a bridge. And then um, we also have compromised periodontal teeth, and these should not be used as abutments for a bridge either. And so compromised periodontal teeth are weaker, and we'll cover why in the next slide. I also kind of touched on it before when I talked about bone support. So next, let's talk about some important concepts that will pop up again and again in the world of prosthodontics. So the first one that I alluded to before is the crown to root ratio. And so the crown to root ratio is just as it sounds. We're comparing the length of the crown to the length of the root. But this isn't the anatomic crown and the anatomic root that we're concerned about. We're concerned about the clinical crown and the clinical root. That's what's showing above the gums and hidden below um, the gum or below the bone, I should say, clinically. So if we're looking at, say, this this tooth right here, we'd say, well, you know, this is the crown component, here's the CEJ, and then everything below that is part of the root. Well, for crown to root ratio, we're all about the bone here. And so we're going to define the crown as everything from here all the way down to when we get to bone here. And then everything below that is, we would consider the root for this ratio. So ideally, we'd want something that's a one to two ratio, where you have one part crown and two parts embedded in bone. That's a nice supported tooth, and we'd love to use that for an abutment tooth for a bridge. Two to three is more realistic. A one to one ratio, maybe this one could maybe edge out like a one, especially on the distal side here, a one to one crown ratio. That's the minimum, absolute minimum that we could use for an abutment tooth. And a two to one ratio is poor and should not be used for abutments. And so this one right here, I'd say if we broke this up into thirds, that's one third of the crown. There's two thirds of the clinical crown that is above the bone. And the last third would be the root here. So two parts to one, that is not ideal. This tooth should not be used as an abutment at all. And so that's what I was talking about. When you have an endodontically compromised tooth or a periodontally compromised tooth, neither of those situations should be considered to be used as abutment teeth for bridges. All right, next we want to talk about Ante's Law. This is another very uh, critical central concept when thinking about uh, fixed bridge prostheses. So Ante's Law states that the PDL surface area of the abutment teeth should be equal to or greater than the imaginary PDL surface area of the missing teeth. So I think this is a really nice image to talk about this, 
and we'll use um, several different colors to kind of illustrate what this law is talking about. So here in this image, we're going to say build a bridge between this premolar and this molar. And there's a premolar and molar that are missing from this patient. So the PDLs of the abutment teeth that we would be using would be from here and would go wrap around these roots connecting to the alveolar bone. So that's the PDL surface area in you know a 2D plane of space, of course, of the two abutment teeth. Now, the imaginary teeth have been shadowed in here on the image, so we could say their PDLs, if they were still existing, would be here and here. So in this situation, we could say, well, the area or the length of blue that I drew is about equal to the length of red that I drew. So this would be a situation that abides by Ante's law. The PDL surface area of the abutment teeth in blue are, is about equal to the imaginary PDL space or PDL surface area of those missing teeth had they still been there. Now, Imagine if there had been one additional molar here, say this is the third molar and there is one more in here, and we'd have to draw another area of PDL. Now the imaginary PDL outweighs the PDL surface area that is currently there, and this would be violating Ante's law. And so this would have a bad bridge prognosis because Think about it, the bridge is just longer span if we add more teeth throughout this bridge. And so these teeth will be, um, will be pushed past their limits and that bridge would have a poor prognosis. And the, the teeth simply would either, the teeth would be damaged or the bridge would break at a connector or something would go wrong and that bridge would have a bad prognosis. Now, if there was only this one premolar here and this other molar hadn't been missing, well, that would be an even better situation according to Ante's law, and the bridge would have an even better prognosis. So you can kind of see how this Ante's law can be used to very simply look at a case and say, you know, how many teeth are missing? What teeth are supporting it? Are they teeth with really short roots? very small PDL surface areas, or are they these nice big molars with multiple roots, which gives you a lot more surface area. So there's, this also, there's also this concept of splinting. And so splinting teeth together distributes occlusal forces. It shares the occlusal forces among all the teeth because they're splinted together as one singular unit. This would be recommended where the periodontal surface of an abutment tooth is not sufficient to support the bridge, which is a failure of Ante's law, which we just talked about. So that would be the example of having a premolar to molar bridge with one premolar and two molars missing, and the imaginary PDLs outweigh the actual PDLs. So you could say splint together that premolar with the adjacent canine and you get a little bit more periodontal surface area. Now if you splint it together the canine and the incisors, now you're getting into multiple splinted teeth, not a great prognosis going back to one of our uh, first slides we talked about. When replacing a canine, the central and lateral should be splinted together to prevent lateral drifting of the bridge. This is something that uh, has come up on um, a board question before, so I did want to make sure I included it. This is a, a kind of unique concept, and it's used only for when you're talking about replacing canines, particularly maxillary canines. All right, and then we have this concept of root shape. And I kind of mentioned this before when I was talking about how molars are great teeth to be used to support a bridge because they have more roots. And with more roots, you have more surface area, more PDL surface area 
to put in the bank for Auntie's Law. So the ideal, ideal root shape for an abutment tooth would be to have divergent roots, to have multiple, two or three roots even, to make sure they're curved and that they're broad. This is like the ideal situation for the perfect abutment tooth. And all of these are preferred to their antitheses, which would be fused, single, conical, and round roots, which just think about which teeth would be easiest to extract. You know, you'd love to see fused roots, single, conical, round, That's that all sounds great. Divergent, multiple curved broad roots, uh, that doesn't sound like an easy extraction. So those are much better at supporting and providing more periodontal support and stability for a bridge. All right, so let's move on to um, partial dentures or RPDs, removable partial dentures, because as you can already tell, there are some situations where bridges just won't cut it. And we might want to introduce the removable partial denture as an option for the patient. So RPDs are indicated in these uh, scenarios, especially where you have a distal extension. That means that all of the teeth distal to a certain point are missing. And uh, if there's a long span of missing teeth where a bridge would not be viable, you have bone loss around potential abutments and a bridge or an implant would just be too expensive for the patient. These are all situations that certainly arise all the time and a partial denture becomes a more highly recommended option. And then of course we have the complete denture, which is used when all teeth in an arch, either upper or lower or both, are missing completely. This is contraindicated in the upper arch when only the mandibular anterior teeth are present because severe damage to the opposing premaxilla occurs. And this is known as combination syndrome, which occur which this this concept appears all over the board exam. So I'm going to be when we talk about complete dentures, I'll be talking all about that making sure I cover it very thoroughly because that will certainly appear on the exam and definitely want to make sure you're prepared for that. There's also this concept of overdenture. I just wanted to mention really briefly. It's another denture option for um, completely edentulous patients. Edentulous meaning you're missing teeth, either upper arch or lower arch, or, or if you're completely edentulous, you're missing all of your teeth. And an overdenture Sort of the classic, um, the classic numbers to think about would be having two implants placed in the lower arch and a denture that seats and clicks into those implants and four implants in the upper arch. So you can think two for the lower, four for the upper. That's kind of the very classic arrangement of implant placement for an overdenture. Then going more into implants, there's the cement retained implant option and the screw retained implant option. The cement retained implant is more economical. It allows for minor angle correction, easier to use in small teeth, requires more chair time, and has the same propensity to loosen as a screw retained implant. And the biggest thing I want to talk about is excess cement can cause peri-implantitis. And peri-implantitis is essentially periodontitis that occurs around an implant. So not only are you getting gum inflammation, um, or I should say soft tissue inflammation around that implant, you're also getting bone loss, irreversible bone loss. And so having cement that's not cleaned up properly after this crown is cemented onto the implant abutment, this can cause problems for the patient. So sometimes cement retained implants are not recommended for that very reason. The other big option is the screw retained implant, which has some pros to it, also has some cons. One of the pros is that it can be retrievable. You can uh, unscrew the implant crown, allowing for it to be removed, and you can clean around it very well and then always place it back on. 
there's an access hole to be able to access that screw through either the occlusal of a posterior tooth or the lingual of an anterior tooth. So it depends on the aesthetic considerations and how that implant has been placed in the patient, whether or not the screw access hole will go through a place that isn't going to impact aesthetics. Now, one problem is that the screw may loosen during function and could uh, require some frequent maintenance visits. Alrighty, so that is a brief overview of some of the treatment options we have in prosthodontics and some of the classic central concepts like crown to root ratio and Ante's law that'll appear again and again as we talk about prosthodontics and dive more into this extremely interesting branch of dentistry. So thanks so much for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you all in the next one.